All right. Well, joining me now is a very special guest here on Credlin. He's known as Mr Brexit, the chief raconteur, disruptor and former leader of the Brexit party. Of course, I could only be talking about one man, Nigel Farage, who's on his way down under. Yes, a special live tour next month and his message could not be more pertinent. The history and identity of the West is under threat from enemies abroad and here at home. It's time to stand and fight. Indeed. Joining me now live from London is Nigel Farage. Nigel, welcome. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I must begin our talk, though, by getting a special report from you on how dinner went the other night with Peter Credlin in London. <laughs> it was terrific. She was on absolutely great form, as you would expect. Uh, but it's really interesting when you talk about the problems in Australia, the problems in the UK, New Zealand, Canada, America. You know, you realise that what's happening over and over is we're getting people who become party leaders, who become prime ministers, who pretend that they are going to be conservative, pretend they're going to stand up for the nation, pretend they're going to fight the globalists, and actually they all govern as social democrats or almost socialists. So we were talking about those comparisons, you know, Scott Morrison perhaps being a very good example, and Boris Johnson in some ways an even better example. So we've got this real disconnect going on that we know where the left are going. I mean, they're going mad. You know, they want to destroy everything about our history, our identity, our culture, the value of the family. Um, they sort of think that it's absolutely fine that somebody who's six foot three has gone through puberty as a male, now becomes a female swimmer. We know where the left are. Mm. But why are our educational institutions, why are we giving in to this sort of woke nonsense that wants to destroy us? Well, frankly, frankly, I point the finger of blame at conservative leaders because they pretend at election time. They pretend to be conservative and they govern on the left. So really, you know, what I'm coming to say is this. We had a British Conservative Party that was all at sea, lost. I came along and posed the biggest threat to them they've had in their 200-year history. And you know what? They learned the lesson. They went to the country in 2019 on my agenda and they won an 80-seat majority. So when Conservative parties actually are conservative, they win elections. All you've then got to do is make them govern that way once they're in power. And, you know, unless ordinary people stand up and fight, we are going to lose everything our forebears built and defended. These are crucial warnings. I want to go back to your first point about our former Prime Minister Scott Morrison, and no doubt Peter told you about his power grab, appointing himself secretly, I might add, to five ministerial positions. It falls into line with all that power-hungry behaviour we witnessed from control freaks right throughout the pandemic, doesn't it? Absolutely. Um, it, and it also tells you about the type of people we've got in politics. For these people, politics is a career. They're in it for advancement of themselves. They're in it for rank title position. They're not in it because they're driven by a cause, a set of values, a set of beliefs. Um, and again, you know, political party members, I mean, think about America. In America, anybody can run to be a congressman, a senator, a state governor, a president. You know, Donald Trump, a businessman and a TV celebrity, walked down the stairs in Trump Tower, said, I'm going to run. Uh, and hey, you know what? He won. At least in the UK, the Conservative Party members are currently choosing who the next Prime Minister is. In Australia, when it comes to the Liberal Party making these decisions, well, it seems that it's just those in elected office that make the decision and the membership gets just completely left out of the process. So, so I think, you know, frankly, there needs to be a proper rebellion that goes on within Conservatism. And, and, and I would like to think that I've given an example of perhaps how it might work. Yeah, it's bubbling up at the moment. I can tell you that from first-hand experience. All right, one point you mentioned about Boris Johnson uh, turning away from his Conservative roots, and now he's gone, you've got this playoff going on between Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak. What are your thoughts on who will win and who should win? 
Well, Rishi Sunak is the ultimate globalist. I mean, not just a former employee of Goldman Sachs, but a man who seems to be very, very keen on central bank digital currencies. Um, so really, enough said when it comes to Rishi. He's put taxes up to the highest level in 70 years, and he's supposed to be a conservative. Liz Truss, well, this is a real enigma. She backed Remain in the referendum. She voted three times for Mrs May's treacherous sell out of Brexit. But now, oh, now she's a born again Brexiteer and she wants to start defending our borders and doing all the things that need to be done. Now, do we believe her? Uh, is this a real Damascene change that's, that's happened within Liz Truss's heart and soul? Or is she just telling the electorate what she thinks they want to hear? I really very much hope that I'm wrong, uh, but I suspect that when she wins, which she will, I mean, you know, guaranteed, slam dunk, when she wins on the 6th of September, becomes Prime Minister, I doubt she's got the conviction or the courage to do the right things. And I think the British Conservative Party is on to lose the next election unless something really big changes fast. As I say, I hope I'm wrong, but the track record does not give me a huge degree of optimism. Well, that's disappointing for Brits. Now, you'll be speaking next month in Melbourne, Sydney and then Brisbane and discussing, as we've been already talking about tonight, the, the uh, I guess, the enemies externally and internally. Can I raise a point about an external enemy? China. And it's not so subtle aim to take Taiwan, probably by force. You've said that China poses the biggest threat to Australia since the 1940s. Are we doing enough to stand up to them, do you think? No, not yet. I, I think we've woken up. I think, you know, certainly Australia has woken up. And, and, and uh, I think Donald Trump actually did wake the world up to the threat that China posed. So at least we're thinking and talking about it. But the truth is, there are too many within our political systems, within our media, and particularly within business, who see China as an opportunity to make money for themselves, to do well for, <laughs> for, for themselves. Um, and I think because of that, you know, we, we, we find ourselves in this nightmare position. I mean, you know, they've threatened Australia, they've bullied Australia, but actually we've become dependent upon them. So many of their goods do we buy. So we've got to economically wean ourselves off dependence on China, and we're not really doing that, I don't think. Now, you're right there. You've got to find new markets. We've got to become more independent. Now, finally, I'm sure you'll have the PC police and... Australian woke culture vultures after you when you're here and you're starting to speak, you may as well send them a message now. Go right ahead. Well, look, guys, either you believe in a free, civilised democracy or you don't. I don't agree with much of what you stand for, but I would absolutely defend to the end your right to be able to say it. So just because you don't like my views... Just because you think we should have open borders and no countries and some sort of weird John Lennon land, it's not for me. But equally, if you genuinely believe in the democratic process, if you believe in freedom, if you believe in liberty, then don't try and stop people coming to hear what I've got to say. Spot on. Absolutely brilliant as usual, Nigel. Thank you so much for joining Credlin. Thank you. You can get your tickets too, by the way, to see Nigel Farage and meet him too, by the way, on this Australian tour at nigellive.com.au. nigellive.com.au. He's in Melbourne on Monday the 26th of September, Sydney Tuesday the 27th of September and Brisbane Thursday the 29th of September. You will not want to miss it.